It's no secret. Among all of the class acts and overwhelmingly positive characters in the NFL, there is a select population of guys who for one reason or another have found themselves categorized as a problem child. Like I said, it could be for any range of offenses, some of them which are more serious than others. Odell Beckham got it for being somewhat careless with his public persona, pulling stunts like the famous field goal net incident when he was with the New York Giants, or the fact that he was handing out cold hard cash to college kids after his alma mater, LSU, won the national championship. Neither of those transgressions are particularly malicious, but even so, he has gotten lumped in with the likes of Antonio Brown who has shown himself to be a legitimate crazy person and is facing some serious allegations from the state. And if you want to take it a step further, there are guys like Greg Hardy, who played in the league for six seasons, despite being an indisputably bad person. But there is one thing that all three of those guys have in common, and that is they all got second chances. Granted, it was for transgressions of varying severity, but because of how talented they are, each of them had a new life in the NFL after initially being cast aside. It happened with Odell when he went from New York to the Cleveland Browns, it happened with A.B. when he went from the Steelers to the Raiders and then the Patriots, and it even happened with Hardy, who went to the Cowboys after being arrested while playing for the Carolina Panthers. At the end of the day in the NFL, talent talks, and if you are able to make good use of your second chance, there will always be a spot for you in the league. And that's not to say that all of these guys, or any of the other ones who have capitalized on their second chances, are necessarily saints or role models, then again, no one is really asking them to be. But there is one player who rose from the ashes of nearly being blackballed from the league to become one of the best leaders in the entire NFL, and a guy who is now widely regarded as a role model for the youths of America, and that is none other than the honey badger, Tyran Matthew. Just to get one thing clear straight off the bat, Matthew never had a reputation as a bad person, but he did seem to have his own demons, which made it hard for him to stay out of trouble. His story in the public spotlight starts down in the bayou in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, when he entered the limelight as a standout sophomore for the LSU Tigers way back in 2011. Matthew had a solid 2010 season in which he played all 13 games as a true freshman, but he had a breakout performance during the 2010 Cotton Bowl, which more or less served as his coming out party. During that insane performance against Texas A&M, he finished with 5.5 tackles, a fumble recovery, and an interception that sealed the game. Matthew was named MVP of the Cotton Bowl for his clutch steady performance and was subsequently slotted into a starting role for his aforementioned sophomore season, a decision he would reward his coaches for handsomely. During that 2011 season, Matthew put together one of the more impressive seasons for a defensive back in recent memory, notching 77 total tackles, 60 solo and 17 assists, 1.5 sacks, 5 forced fumbles, 4 fumble recoveries, 2 of which he returned for touchdowns, and 2 interceptions. He also added to the Tigers special teams unit, returning 26 punts for 420 yards and 2 touchdowns. Simply put, Matthew was a beast, and people started to take note, especially after a dominant performance in the 2011 SEC Championship game. LSU was trailing 10 to nothing against a Georgia side that was impressive all season long, and that was when the Honey Badger had decided he'd had about enough of the whole losing thing. Matthew ripped off a game-changing, momentum-shifting 62-yard punt return that gave LSU its first points, and from that point forward, Georgia didn't score a single point on LSU's defense, resulting in a 42-10 victory. And yet again, like the Cotton Bowl the year before, Matthew earned MVP honors. After that SEC title game, the myth of the Honey Badger really started to take off, just like Johnny Football Mania in 2012. You couldn't go more than five minutes on a sports website, on talk radio, or even the major networks without hearing about the undersized kid out of LSU affectionately known as the Honey Badger, a nickname that paid homage to the small but fearless animal that went viral on YouTube around the same time. Everyone was talking about Matthew's ability to make big-time plays in big-time moments, despite his miniature size. In fairness, he did have that kind of an it factor, where because of his presence alone, the Tigers never felt like they were out of a game. But sadly, one bad omen from his sophomore season continued to haunt him and reared its ugly head just as his popularity was starting to hit a fever pitch. The incident in question took place in October 2011, 
when Matthew was suspended for one game following a violation of LSU's drug policy. Matthew initially handled the incident well, accepting responsibility and continuing to explain that he had learned his lesson. He would go on to say, I have to grow up fast in this business. It definitely humbled me off the field. I think you have to go through things to see the bigger picture. My teammates were there for me and my coaches were there for me. So it was really about me trying to stay focused on the things that mean the most to me. And that's being a student at LSU and wearing those colors every Saturday. While all of that sounds good, it did sort of sound a little rehearsed, if you will. As it turns out, it was because this one game suspension was just a drop in the bucket when it came to Matthew's struggles with staying in line. And as Stephen A would say, staying off the weed. Stay off the weed. This became evident fast as the summer following his surprise Heisman finalist season. Rumors continued to circulate about Matthew's reported drug usage. It culminated in a mid-August announcement that Matthew was to be dismissed from LSU's football team following another violation of team and school rules. According to Matthew's interview with Men's Journal, the positive test followed a lonesome and depressive streak that came after the team's brutal 21-0 loss to the Alabama Crimson Tide in the 2011 BCS title game. In his words, the fallout from the team's performance pushed him to the point that he thought, F it, I might as well smoke. He did remain on campus that fall, taking classes and hoping that he would eventually be reinstated, but any hope quickly dissipated when there was a bust at his apartment and Matthew was charged with simple possession, forcing him to spend the night in county jail. It's an experience that Matthew credits with setting him on the right track for good serving as the rock-bottom moment he needed to truly hit amid all of his success and address the scars of his past so he could finally move on with his life. And in fairness to the honey badger, he has faced more than his fair share of battle wounds in life, most of which were not his doing. Matthew grew up in the 7th Ward in New Orleans, which is widely recognized as one of the most dangerous corners of the entire country. At his birth, his mother left him at her parents' house and ran off, in his words, to chase dudes. Ouch and it somehow only got worse from there. His father was in jail for murdering a man when Tyran was just two years old and didn't show the slightest bit of interest in him until he started to have success at LSU. And the list of tragedies goes on and on. Three of his uncles were dead, one from AIDS contracted from a dirty needle, another murdered in cold blood while holding his baby son in the street. The third was killed in an argument in one of the local projects. His aunt died in a hit-and-run accident, and worst of all, his grandfather, who took him in, died of heart failure resulting from extensive heroin usage. When you start to unpack everything that Matthew went through, his whole story starts to make more and more sense. How could you not turn to drugs or anything, really, that would provide a degree of comfort or numbness amid all the chaos? Keep in mind, this was all before he even made it to LSU, and Matthew was still living in the projects down in the 7th Ward. That was until Hurricane Katrina came and destroyed his grandparents' house, which left the family homeless for over a year. This was a turning point for the teenage Tyran, who started turning to marijuana as a much-needed distraction from the night terrors and seemingly eternal anxiety that was riddling him in those days. Even with all this negativity in his life, Matthew was determined to make something of himself. It was just a matter of figuring out how. He reached out to his mother following his grandfather's death and asked her, straight up, if he could move back in with her. It was a request that she heartbreakingly declined, causing young Matthew to spiral further into drug use. He explained his usage rather astutely to men's journals, saying, That's why I wound up smoking so much weed, it smoothed out all of my highs and lows. His environment certainly exacerbated his drug use, as he definitely was not alone in turning to marijuana as a refuge. Most of my team was smoking, says Matthew. I mean, we practiced at this park where half the time gunshots were going off. It's hard not to look at a situation a little bit differently knowing the extent of his personal trauma. Anyway, that's enough negativity for one video. Let's go back to the turning point in his life, the aftermath of the night he spent in county jail. Matthew, now certain that his time at LSU was over with, reached out to former Tigers teammate and mentor Patrick Peterson, who had left school to go to the NFL as a lottery pick following the 2011 season. His father lived in Florida and trained players for the NFL Combine, so Peterson arranged for his father to take Matthew in and train him for the 2012 NFL Draft. The duo worked furiously for months, determined to turn it around, and when the 2012 Combine rolled around, Matthew was a rejuvenated man. He had rededicated himself to his faith, to taking care of his body, 
into reaching the ultimate goal of escaping the shadows of his sadness to achieve greatness. Unfortunately, but understandably, he did run into a bit of a snafu during the whole draft process. Nearly all of the NFL teams were wary of taking Matthew, fearing that his past would again come rearing its ugly head. The only team who decided to roll the dice and take a chance on Matthew were the Arizona Cardinals, where he had an established All-Pro in Patrick Peterson vouching for him heavily. Matthew also submitted to an extensive drug testing program and proved he was in fact clean and ready to make an impact on the NFL level. The Cardinals stayed true to their word and ended up taking Matthew in the third round of the 2012 NFL Draft, which ended up being a steal considering that, despite struggling with injuries early in his career, Matthew, like Peterson, earned all pro honors for Arizona. For all the sadness he endured, Matthew has truly and completely righted the ship and has turned all of that negativity into wisdom, as he now serves as a mentor to a number of young players around the league. Now a multi-millionaire, a Super Bowl champion, and a beacon of hope, Tyran Matthew has one of the most incredible story arcs in NFL history. What did you think of Tyran Matthew's incredible life story? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section down below. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. We'll see you guys next time on TBS for more cool videos every single day.